If you think talking about mental illness is scary, imagine what happens when we don't talk about it. Join the conversation. Visit letstalkstigma.org. Hello, everybody. I'm Matt Smith, board member of the Anti-Stigma Coalition. And on behalf of all of us, I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our series of Facebook Live events. This time, we are focusing on the state of stigma, mental health challenges in rural communities. According to the U.S. Census, there are nearly 336 million people in the United States. The vast majority live in areas classified as urban, while approximately 14% of us, or around 47 million, live in rural communities. Obviously, living in a rural community is a different lifestyle than living in an urban center. Sights, sounds, smells, the pace, all can be quite different. Distance plays a role in many aspects of life, ranging from access to amenities to simply the number of in-person human interactions one might have access to on a daily basis. How do the conditions in a rural setting impact mental health? Does stigma play a role in how people in rural communities seek or don't seek out help when needed? What are some of the other obstacles and what can be done to overcome them? Today, our panelists will explore these and other related questions. But before I introduce our panelists, a couple of quick things. Our program is for up to one hour. During this time, if you have a question or comment, please type it into the chat box and we'll respond accordingly. Your questions often lead to some great dialogue, so please don't be shy. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Connie Damaris. With a master's degree in clinical psychology, Connie's professional experience includes over 35 years in the human services field of maternal and child health, mental health, and home visiting programs. Helping organizations, professionals, and families to cope with life stressors is her passion. Connie's current role is a community coalitions coordinator with the Niagara County Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Her work involves consulting in two different rural communities, assisting them in improving their responses and prevention strategies for maternal and early child health and mental health needs. Being a mother, stepmother, and a grandmother has also helped Connie to be tuned into real-time struggles for several generations. As a longtime resident and service provider in rural communities, Connie has found the challenges in finding and accessing services, both personally and professionally, to be an ongoing frustration with no simple solution. Welcome to our discussion, Connie. I'm so happy to be here, Matt. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, we're glad to have you. Next up is Jeff Winton. Jeff is founder and chairman of Rural Minds, a national nonprofit organization with a mission to serve as the informed voice for mental health in rural America and to provide mental health information and resources. Due to a family tragedy, Jeff decided to devote a significant portion of his energies to connecting rural Americans to much needed mental health services and helping them to tell their personal stories to assist others on similar journeys. In addition to being the founder and chairman of Rural Minds, Jeff is the founder and owner of Wall Street Dairy LLC, a working family dairy farm in Chautauqua County, New York, and a member of a multi-generational farm family. He has worked four decades as a communications and corporate affairs leader with, a Fortune, with Fortune 100 corporations and respected public relations and advertising agencies. This global experience spans highly diverse and dynamic industries, including the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, animal health, agricultural, and consumer arenas. Winton is also Chief Executive Officer of Jeff Winton Associates, a full-service communications and corporate affairs agency he co-founded in 2020. He has deep experience on both a professional and extremely personal level with efforts to educate about depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, substance abuse disorder, and other forms of mental illness that has led him to create rural minds. Jeff graduated with distinction from Cornell University with a Bachelor of Science degree from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Additionally, Jeff was appointed to the advisory board of New York FarmNet, a nonprofit organization that helps New York State farms address financial, family, and social stress. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Matt. Wonderful. Well, glad to see both of you. This is a very interesting topic I think we have going for us today. Um, let's start, though, by hearing more about the work that each of you are doing. Uh, Jeff, could you please tell us more about Rural Minds, its mission, how did it come about, what does the work look like? how people can get involved, those kinds of things. Yeah, certainly. Well, thank you for asking, Matt. Rural Minds is a relatively new organization. We were founded in 2022, so we're not even three years old yet. 
Um, and it's a result, as you mentioned during the introduction, of a family tragedy that took place in my farm family here in Chautauqua County from a long line of farmers. And my nephews and nieces also grew up on the family farm and worked here alongside their parents and their grandparents. And my 28-year-old nephew, Brooks, who was the father of three-year-old twins at the time, uh, unknowingly was suffering from various forms of mental illness and substance use disorder, we suspect. And before we could seek intervention for him, he died by suicide. And it caught the family and the community completely off guard because he was a very gregarious, very happy-go-lucky guy who had tons of friends and had a wonderful life, so we thought. But again, because he was raised in rural Western New York, like I was and generations before him, we were all taught from a very early age not to talk about our problems, to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and to get over it. And I suspect that's what happened with my nephew. So we founded this organization in memory of my nephew and are a national organization. We're based here in Chautauqua County, actually here at my dairy farm in Mayville, New York, but uh, we are national in scope. I just came back from downstate Illinois last week. I'm heading out to Montana soon. So our work spans most of the country. And sadly, what we experience here in Western New York from a stigma standpoint exists across all rural areas of this country. The, the challenges may be a bit unique or different depending on where you are, but a lot of the stigma is very much the same. So our focus has been on getting people to talk more openly about what has been in their own experience as well as their families, because our belief is if people can get comfortable or at least willing to talk about their issues and things that have happened in their family, they're more likely to then admit they have an issue and go and seek intervention. So uh, we we do a lot of storytelling work, and that's why whenever I talk, I did a meeting last night in Fredonia, New York, and we had a number of the college students there. And I always start my presentations with my own family story because I think it's important to put a face on this epidemic and to humanize it and to show that you know a number of us have been living similar journeys than many of the people in the audience probably have. Well, I can imagine it's, it's a lot about giving people, giving people the words, giving people the, the stage and the microphone, making a safe space, uh, a forum where a lot of these dialogues can occur, I imagine is part of the work. Yeah, it is. But, you know, I always like to say, including the meeting I did last night in Fredonia, is that we don't expect everybody to be up in front of you know dozens of people yeah. speaking, but we do want them to get comfortable talking to at least one person because uh -huh. if they can share what they're dealing with with one person, if my nephew would have felt comfortable sharing it with one person, uh, including somebody in our family, and we're a very close farm family, um, I think the outcome probably would have been a tad different. One never knows. but. So we're trying to get people to at least start talking about mental illness and substance use disorder. Like we readily talk now about COVID. We talk about cancer, we talk about diabetes. And because mental illness, especially in rural areas has been so stigmatized, people still don't even consider it an illness, which it is very much an illness. And there's also the genetic predisposition in families. I know certainly in my family, but again, because we've never felt comfortable talking about it in rural parts of this country, people still aren't treating it the same way they do a lot of other illnesses that families are dealing with today. No doubt. We've got a lot to talk about. So thank you for sharing all of that, Jeff, and for the valuable work that you're doing on a, on a national scale. Thank really you. Really appreciate you making the time to be with us. Connie, I'd like to hear a little bit about the, the coalition work with those two communities up in mm -hmm. Niagara County. What's What goes on with that? 
Sure. Um, we're working on a variety of different levels here, Matt, um, throughout the county. We have different coalitions that technically focus on different ideas or challenges, but they all really are under the same thing. We're really trying to just strengthen the communities in whichever way, shape, or form that we can. Um, one of the primary ones here in Niagara is called the Community Network of Care, and that's really a collaboration of a variety of different kinds of organizations such as schools and universities and service providers and peers which have brought actually some really really wonderful experience yeah. and insight and knowledge into the work not only that we're doing now but where we should be going um, we also work with the Niagara County Task Force for Public Awareness on the opioid addiction crisis here mm -hmm. in Niagara County, as well as the Suicide Prevention Center. Um, recently, we have been focusing in the last year or so since I've been here, our members of our coalitions have really wanted to look at the idea of prevention. So how are we looking to see what's happening now and when it is? So with that thought, we really started to look at the early childhood field. What's mm -hmm. happening with those kiddos now? Where can we get a beat on how they're doing overall? What are some of the social emotional issues we know about? And how can we perhaps get them help or get the parents help in parenting to really try to alleviate some of these more difficult topics and challenges later on in life. We're also looking at currently the veteran community as well as the faith-based communities, mm -hmm. which are very prevalent, right, in our rural communities. That's where a lot of our people will find some of their support systems and mm -hmm. some people that they're more comfortable in going with or to if they have any concerns in their health. Our goals now in all of these coalitions are really not necessarily always to rely on the traditional therapies or medication model, but to look at how can we basically shore up the people that are already in these communities, such as the clergy, such as the school systems. And we've tried to get a little creative is looking at the libraries. Mm -hmm. and the and the social clubs that are mm -hmm. in some of these communities that actually do have a lot of sites in our smaller cities here in Niagara County in particular. So the recent focus more in Chautauqua County, I work in both counties, is looking again more at prevention and bringing in different therapies that we've identified are evidence-based and getting the people there that we know about already, they're doing great work. Let's just give them more tools. It only takes one of us to reach out and reach any particular person within our professional life or our personal life. So Such that's valuable. Fine. Such valuable work, Connie, and it's again the convening of all the stakeholders is of course so crucial because everyone has a role to play, mm -hmm. but quite often there needs to be somebody in the room who is some professional background, some training, some knowledge, it's the difference between doing things that feel like they're doing good and things that are actually doing good, having your voice involved. And I think that's really crucial. So congratulations on all you're doing with that. Thank you. I'd like to start really kind of at the very beginning with, with this issue, kind of a base issue of, you know, people live in different places. Everybody's experience in America isn't the same, you know, suburban, rural, urban, different, right? So what are some of the biggest differences when you live in a rural setting versus an urban and suburban experience? Who'd like to go first? I'll be happy to go. Thank you, John. Um, so I was raised in Chautauqua County, raised on a farm. And so I spent the first almost 18 years of my life in a town of 500 people. And we weren't even in the town, we're in a farm outside the town. So I just assumed that's how the rest of the world lived. I then went to Cornell University where I laugh, but it's true. There were more students in my dorm building than we had in all of Sinclairville, New York. So yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it was quite a shock to go from this little town to a huge university like Cornell. And then subsequently I ended up moving to New York City, which was another shock. So mm -hmm. because of my career, as you said, I've been working in the healthcare field for a number of years. Um, I've moved around a lot, but inevitably most of the places I've lived 
have been either suburban or urban areas because that's where the healthcare companies had been. And while my family is all here in Chautauqua County and 20 years ago, I bought the farm where I'm talking to you from today, I only visited for holidays. My parents were both still alive at that time. So I kind of jetted in, I caught my breath. I thought, oh, this is great. I'd love to live here one day, but then I'd go back to the rat race of, you know, big city living. And so when we launched Rural Minds, I was actually living in the suburbs of Chicago at that time. And I said, I really need to be living back in rural America. If I'm going to be effective in leading a new non-for-profit organization focused on rural America. So I moved back to this farm where, again, I live now and, and where Rural Minds is based full time. And I've got to say, I'm two years into it and I am still adjusting because I am used to having all the services and all the amenities of big city living. And uh, one, one example is I moved back here. I needed, of course, a new dentist, a new primary care physician, new barber. You know, you start all over again. It literally took me six months to get into a primary care physician because we have such a shortage here in right. this part of Western New York. Fortunately, I wasn't ill. If I was, I would have ended up in the ER, I guess. But, you know, and so if there's a shortage of primary care physicians, you can only imagine the shortage of mental health providers we have. I mean, that last statistic I saw is that 65% of rural counties don't have a practicing psychiatrist. So, we, we have, you know, a real shortage of healthcare providers, regardless what type of healthcare you're talking about. But, you know, the other thing for me that I've been dealing with is the somewhat isolation you feel at times uh, okay. living in a rural area. You know, if you're living in a suburban area, you have neighbors right next door or certainly in an urban area. I'm looking out the windows of my office right now and where I live on this beautiful farm in Chautauqua County, I have no neighbors. My closest neighbors are Buffalo at the farm next door to us. So, um, you know, it's a very peaceful type of existence. But, you know, underneath the facade, there are a lot of challenges. And that's the thing that I always like to stress to urban audiences I speak to is that people have this romanticized idea of what rural America is like. Of course, everybody's now watching Yellowstone, right? So right. they think that life on a farm is all Yellowstone. Well, let me tell you, it's not. There's a lot of <clears throat> suffering that takes place. There's a lot of isolation. There's a lot of obstacles and issues that you have many times. I mean, it's a beautiful place and I'm truly glad I'm back here, but I have a new appreciation for the challenges that come with life in a rural area. So uh, even if you do have providers somewhat nearby, many people, especially farmers, like the people that work here on our farm, um, it's hard to get away. It's hard to leave the farm, especially on a dairy farm like we have, and travel any distance because there's always work that needs to be done. You know, people think, well, you know, you can't find a doctor nearby, you just hop on, and do a telehealth appointment. Well, that's all fine and good if you have broadband. 30% of the families in rural America have no broadband service. Even here on the road where I'm talking to you from, five minutes from Chautauqua Institution, um, there are homes on our street that have no broadband because it's only available in certain parts of this particular town. So telemedicine, while it's helped many people, it still isn't the panacea that a lot of people believe it is. And the last thing I'd say, and then I, I wanna learn from Connie because she's been doing this much longer than I have, is that mm -hmm. a lot of people in rural America are uninsured or underinsured. So, yeah. you know, they don't have jobs like I had in big city America where, you know, you had the top of the line insurance and many people have no insurance or they have very minimal insurance because that's all they can afford. And as a result, if you are suffering from depression and diabetes, you've got to take your insulin, right? So you have to make some very difficult choices. And so um, that, that is another challenge that many people have that I don't think a lot of 
other people that don't live in rural America understand. People just assume, well, of course they have insurance. Well, they don't. A lot of small town businesses, a lot of farms can't necessarily afford to provide insurance to their workers. And so they're left to, you know, fend for themselves. So I I could go on and on, but I promise I'm not going to do that. And I'll like no, 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 no. It's, it's it's all good. I, I think one of the other uh, things I think that people believe is that it's got to be so wonderfully stress free <laughs> living out there with just the birds chirping and the cow and all those different things. And yeah. you just touched on some of the things that could be very stressful for a person who lives out there. Yeah. Well, life on a farm in particular on a dairy farm is very stressful. We start mm -hmm. at five in the morning during certain times of the year when we're putting in crops, we're going till 10 or 12 at night. So, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid growing up, I got very little sleep and which served me well as I became an adult for many reasons. But, um, you know, there is a things go wrong each and every day. A cow gets yeah. sick, the tractor breaks down, your milking equipment doesn't work, the milk truck gets stuck or can't get to you living here in Western New York because right. of, you know, the weather we used to have, we haven't had in the last couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. But there are a lot of stressors when it comes to farming in particular. And as a result, farmers are twice as likely to die by suicide as any other occupation. And it's it's a multifaceted reason, but a lot of it is due to the stress and a lot of the reasons that I've mentioned. In addition to the stigma, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that because mental illness and substance use disorder is still so stigmatized in rural America, people aren't comfortable talking about it or seeking help. And I tell people in small towns, the best thing is when a family tragedy happens, like what happened in my family a few years ago when we lost my nephew, the whole community gathers around very quickly and news travels very quickly. The flip side of that is if you're dealing with something that you're ashamed about, embarrassed about, which you shouldn't be, but you are, like mental illness, again, the news could travel quickly. If your pickup truck, for example, is seen parked outside a provider that's known for providing services for mental health uh, services, many people are concerned that, gee, my neighbors are gonna find out I'm having some kind of a, an issue and I don't necessarily want them to know that. So the confidentiality issue is very much a issue. People are proud in rural America. People were raised, as I mentioned earlier, to be very independent, to not ask for help. And so when you truly feel you need to ask for help, you know it has to be you know, pretty bad. And people are still hesitant to ask for help, especially help as it relates to uh, a journey they may be on with a various form of mental illness. Very good. Thank you, Jeff. Connie, I'd like your take just in general, life in a rural setting versus other settings. What are the big differences? Well, I think, I mean, in echoing, I mean, j ditto what Jeff said all, to all of it. Um, I think that also having, also living in a rural setting, we're also looking at generations of these types of culture and approaches and attitudes. So it's even sometimes within your own family that you're very reluctant to express some of these, what can be perceived as weaknesses, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, you're, you're, you're weak, you, like Jeff said earlier, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, how are you? These are normal life's ups and downs. Why can't you deal with this in some way, shape or form? I think um, the, also the lack of privacy is a huge, barrier for anybody reaching out. I mean, we used to joke that if one of our kids did something wrong down the street that we would hear about it before they even got home. <laughs> so, um, you know, so, so just imagine any kind of inflammatory information or things that are going to be shaming to some of our people in accessing. Those are going to be found out most likely by our community. And I, you know, the internet thing, broadband internet is always a challenge, as Jeff says. I, we're all lucky. I'm, I'm not. I'm in the professional office. I'm not in my house, because again, that goes on and off depending yeah. on what kind of 
other how many other people are using it on the street and we you know what the activities are going on mm -hmm. in that school down the um in the next neighborhood but lastly i think it's really that we have to remember that some of the transportation challenges and i'm not just mm -hmm. even talking about accessing services which is of course you know one of the major ones but even let's say accessing basic needs i know i have to travel almost a half an hour to get to a grocery store so that doesn't that requires planning and um time and some sort of knowledge about is this going to be a busy time of the day can i fit it in on the way to work or the way home to work or you know is this going to be a busy time of that month for people so it's not just even about accessing services, it's even just daily life. Um, we also recently had the closest, closest, quote unquote, closest hospital closed. So let's say um, I, I'm gonna have to go 50 to, minutes to an hour to get uh, any kind of emergency care. And don't even get me started on maternal care because there's no delivering hospital anywhere close to us. So again, you know, these poor delivering moms in labor are going to have to go a lot further now than they ever have before. So again, just the challenges in in not only accessing services, but the communities themselves, and also just a lack of exposure. My last thought, you know, if you're in an urban setting, most likely you're seeing billboards or ads, or you're getting mm -hmm. flyers in your mailboxes about all kinds of services and exposure to people with different backgrounds and cultures and races. We don't have that same type of exposure out in the rural communities. We're pretty homogenous for the most part. Um, and we don't necessarily even know from a cultural perspective how to interact the best with some of our colleagues or people that we may encounter along life's journey. So some of what we hear, people are basing on what they see on the news or when they can get internet on social media. And that's where they're getting some of their information, which we know isn't necessarily always the most accurate. So I think, you know, narrowing all down, it's really a lack of access to such a variety of different resources and information for the rural community in so many ways. No doubt. I, it's funny. There's a there's a mental health organization that's out where I live and uh, I pass by. They have an interesting marquee, which puts words of wisdom up on a regular basis as you drive by. And uh, one thing they put up one time that really struck me was mental health is balancing time alone and time with others, mm. which I thought was quite profound. What does it do when you don't have access to other human beings as often? Is, is that is that doing is that is that a, a factor with what's going on in the overall mental health in our rural rural places? Jeff, can I ask you to field that one first? Yeah, can you just repeat the question there? You you cut out at one yeah. point, probably because of my bad internet. So, <laughs> <laughs> in case people didn't believe them, here it is. <laughs> yeah, I was talking about the, the idea of seclusion, the idea of not having as much human contact. Jeff's buffering. So, if you didn't believe him before, now you definitely believe him. So, you said, yeah, the idea of, of not having as much human contact and interaction in person on a regular basis and the role that can play in overall mental health. Yeah, overall. well, well, thank you for asking that. The isolation is real. And, you know, it became exacerbated, of course, during COVID because in rural America, you've got limited opportunities for interaction as it is. I mean, you've got the schools, you've got churches, you've got some, you know, organizations like for youth 4-H or FFA or something like that. But you still don't have the multitude of opportunities that people in suburban and urban areas do. So once COVID hit and nobody could go anywhere, I mean, if you live out in the middle of the country like I do and Connie does, it wasn't like you could walk next door to the neighbors because there aren't any neighbors. And so you were pretty much stuck in your house. And again, Connie, doing what you do for a living, I'm sure you saw that things went through the roof especially alcohol use disorder, because people just stayed home and, and drank. And it's something we're going to be dealing with for a long time now. So the opportunities for interaction are very limited. And, you know, this part and parcel goes with something Connie just said, is that it's important to know how to reach people that live in rural areas, because they're not always necessarily reading the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. First of all, they don't have time to, right? Especially if they're farming. 
But when we first started doing research before we launched Rural Minds, because I've worked in healthcare most of my career, I had the opportunity to reach out to NAMI, MHA, a lot of the big, long established organizations. And, you know, I had very frank conversations with them about what they were doing or weren't doing to reach people, the 47 million people that lived in rural America. And I had a couple people tell me very transparently, you know, we really don't know a lot about them. We don't know how to reach them. And, you know, the fact remains, there's a whole ecosystem of media that reaches people in rural America. There's a one of the most popular television stations is one that probably a lot of people on this call have never heard of, but it's called RFD TV. <laughs> and that yeah. is a rurally based, that's what the R stands for, of course, yeah. based television station that's geared towards people that live in rural America. There are print publications, there are radio stations that are geared towards people in rural America. So a big part of what our organization does is to make sure we're tapping into where people are, where they're going for their information. And again, it's not necessarily mainstream media, but it's these other outlets that are tailor-made for people that live in rural America. So we're hoping that by doing that, we're not only again going where they're getting trusted information, but we're starting to build this community and starting to get the message out there to connect people. And you know, I like to say we're the intersection between the agricultural community and the healthcare industry. And we have a number of corporate partners that we work very closely with that represent um, companies like Pfizer, Merck, Johnson & Johnson. But we also work with companies like John Deere and Land Lakes and those companies. And when we launched two years ago, it became very apparent that these two very powerful, successful industries didn't know each other. And they both wanted to do something to reach people in rural America that were suffering from mental illness. But because they didn't know each other, they were each going off doing their own thing. So we've convened them now and brought them together. We meet on a quarterly basis so that people can share what they're doing. And I like to use this example, but I have a family member who lives with bipolar disorder. He's a farmer. He's also buying John Deere tractors. So while he's on an antidepressant, he's also buying farm equipment. And so it only makes sense to get these industries working together because they've got the resources, they've got the lobbying power in Washington and state capitals to help advance the cause of work that Connie's doing, we're doing, and many other very dedicated people that are trying to address this across this country. Wonderful. If anyone is just joining us, I'm Matt Smith of the Anti-Stigma Coalition, and I'm joined by Connie Damaris of the Niagara County Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, and Jeff Winton, founder of National Not-for-Profit Rural Minds. We've been discussing the mental health issues unique to rural settings, but we'll be talking even more about the role of stigma as an impediment to talk about mental health and dealing with mental health issues. Everyone joining us, please do take a minute check out our website, letstalkstigma.org. Maybe join the over 4,000 others in taking the pledge to end stigma. Also, if you are connected with a business, organization, or faith community, you can become an organizational member of the Anti-Stigma Coalition. You can find information for this on the website under the Members tab. All right, now back to the conversation. I um, th Thanks for all that you just shared, Jeff. I, I really, just to transition just a little bit, I'm trying to wonder, is, is there a particular rural culture, you know, a set of values, a set of norms, you know, rules that are generally present. And, and, and what role does that play? Connie, would you like to go first? I, th I think what we have always under operated under is that really that strong work ethic and, and mm -hmm. willpower. And, and these are some of the most strong willed and, and persevering people that you've ever met in your entire lives. Like Jeff has talked about from personal experience, these people work really hard day in yeah. and day out, seven days a week, right? 24 hours a day, some days, I'm sure 52 days. There's no vacation time. There's no sick time. Yeah. Um, these people are really have a determination to really overcome and, and persevere. Um, they're small, like we talked about already, small, closer knit communities. I think 
really they look to support each other as much as possible whenever they can. Um, I think that they're, I know I, you know, unfortunately didn't necessarily have a huge understanding of the farming community until probably about 20 years ago when I had the opportunity to visit a farm and talk to a farmer that managed his own really a business and managing staff and people he hired and now having to worry about, like Jeff was saying, benefits potentially, or, you know, some of the um, temporary workers that we'd have come up to the county for the summer months. What does that look like? So these are so multi-talented people as well. If you think about not just having to have a an interest or a knowledge of the literal farming aspects of it or growing, but in personnel management and business growth and any kind of business aspects that you would never think necessarily that farmers have to worry about. Um, so that's, I think that's my general thing. Yeah, so Matt, I would you- Adi's turn to, to have the- <laughs> Now, we're, now we're, Connie, you got cut off for a second there. Oh, uh, sorry with, about that. The internet. Oh, I, nothing you could do there. But you, all, all very, very valid points, obviously, about the, about some of that. What, what other, what other issues are prevalent though in terms of values? In terms of, uh, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the, the fear of what others might judge you. You know, in terms of, you know, confidentiality and things along those lines, and the, you know, heard it through the grapevine kind of situations. Are there other things that are at play as well? Well, Jeff. one thing that we are really trying to tap into in our work with Rural Minds is the resilience of people mm -hmm. that live in small towns, especially on farms. And in November, uh, we launched a new program in conjunction with the National Grange called the Rural Resilience Program. Uh, the Grange, as you may or may not know, is the oldest agricultural nonprofit in the country. It's been in existence 157 years. Not and the very first today, range in the United in States. Broadband. The impending eclipse has anything to do with it. I don't know. I would I blame something. <laughs> I'm can, sorry, Jeff. We lost you for a minute again, my friend. Oh, can you hear me now? We can now. Yes. Okay, because I see you guys perfectly. So I, it's probably at my end. Yeah. But uh, so this program, we launched the Rural Resilience Program which is on our website, which is ruralminds.org, um, is basically a nod to the resilience that people in rural America have and the fact that they are very independent and many times want to do things on their own. So what we've done is put a, a program of resources together in conjunction with the National Grange so that whether it's a church group, a PTA group, whatever, can put on a community town hall meeting using some of these resources that exist now on our website. We've got PowerPoint presentations. We've even got ways for people to promote this, press releases, things of that nature. And uh, we just did a webinar last night, as a matter of fact, on this very topic. We had over 500 people um, pre-register for this webinar um, to roll this program out. So it's something that I would ask people to, again, go to our website, which is ruralminds.org and look at. Um, the other thing I would say besides, I agree with everything Connie said, is people in rural America are very proud. They're proud of their roots. They're proud of the fact that they are resilient. They're proud of the fact that they work so hard, that mm -hmm. they don't necessarily get a chance to take vacation. So in the case of farmers, for example, and therein lies one of the issues with the high suicide rate amongst farmers, is that once their operation starts to have issues, and in this day and age, unfortunately, in my industry, in dairy farming, unless you're huge and milking hundreds, if not thousands of cows, it's hard to make a living. So a lot of the smaller farms across Western New York and other parts of the country are going out of business because the families either don't have someone in the family to take it over or they can't afford to expand to the point where they will be economically viable. And there's a shame inherent in that because some of these farms, like in my family, have been in the family for generations. And so if someone is facing 
going out of business because they're not making it, they blame themselves. They think they've let all of their ancestors down who worked so hard to found that operation. And so that's where, while pride can be a very positive thing, pride can also be a double-edged sword because that pride is what hurts so many people who are struggling. Um, you mentioned during the introduction FarmNet, and FarmNet is a uh, joint effort between the state of New York and Cornell University. And it's a wonderful program that was first put into effect in the 1980s when the first farm crisis hit. And a lot of farms were going out of business across New York State. And it became very clear very quickly that besides the economic impact that was having on these farm families, families were suffering from depression and suffering from guilt and suffering from a lot of things because of what I just said, because their farms were not doing well. So FarmNet put family counselors on, on board. So now any resident of New York State, and this is only in New York, and it's a program as New Yorkers, we should all be very proud of. If anyone involved in agriculture is having an issue, they can call the hotline at Cornell University and they will be assigned to a free confidential service where a financial counselor and a family counselor will come out to your farm. So you don't have to go anywhere. They will come out, they will meet with you in your barn, they will meet with you at your kitchen table, and they will help you through whatever your family is dealing with. Um, and so it's a, a program that I'm a huge believer in. It's a program that our farm has taken advantage of. And now that I'm involved on the board, I'm, I'm getting a glimpse behind the scenes of just how unique this program is. And the national work that we do, I inevitably brag as a New Yorker about this program in New York State. And every time I say something, the response is, I wish we had that program in Montana. I wish we had that program in California. So it's a model that I truly hope other states will follow, but it's helping so many people in rural America right now, not only farm families, but all of those that surround farm families, because that's the other thing that is so important to understand. It's not just the farmers themselves. It's the whole ecosystem that surrounds a farming community. You've got the diners, you've got the feed mill, you've got the people that, you know, come and breed your cows, you've got the equipment dealers. So there's a ripple effect. When a farm family has an issue, it impacts many other people in that small town. No doubt. I mean, I've often wondered a little bit about how American popular culture doesn't really treat rural America in a very, very kind way. I think for, you know, for decades, I think about every TV program that's ever been the setting for that, you know, from Green Acres and the Beverly Hillbillies to Hee Haw to Dukes of Hazard, it's, yeah. it's not really a very nice portrayal. And I wonder if there's that causes any anger or frustration or pressure, at least subconsciously, uh, to be successful and be smart and not be that. In any case, it's not. We we've established the fact that there are certainly challenges and, and to to in the cultural way uh, towards getting at some of the mental health issues. I'd like to turn our attention to the chat box right now, where some people have asked a couple of questions. And one is: uh, Are there any peer support groups in your community for mental health and wellness that people could look into joining? Connie, why don't you go first? Yes, we actually have several, not only peer support groups, Matt, but I'm so proud to say that in Niagara County we have several peer advocate type of positions are people that are willing again to come to you so we have some in some of the major cities here in niagara but we also have different either activities or um, events that people can come to in a generic sense one of our colleagues started and have been, has become hugely successful a cornhole tournament mm -hmm. and it's gotten extremely large and he calls it um um, tossing and sharing. So as they toss, they, they talk, start talking about some of their journeys and they share with each other what some of their struggles were as well as what some of their successes were. And it has actually expanded across New York State now, but we're proud that it started here in Western right. New York, here in Spencer Niagara County. Um, we have a couple people that will meet some um, of our community residents in the jail systems, unfortunately, you know. These are, are other areas that are having a lot of challenges and 
may be why they're there. Um, and maybe that's not necessarily where they should be, but that's where they ended up. So we have, not like I said, not only support groups here in Niagara, but we also have people that will come to you where you are and, and have been there, right? People with these lived experiences, and not only from a mental health or substance use perspective, but also from somebody that maybe has lived experience with suicide. Either they have a family member or maybe had um, attempted in the past themselves, but that, again, the people that have been there can really speak to the journeys and these struggles, but that there's hope and in the end, and there, there always help. there's always hope, there's always hope. Yeah, a message we cannot say too often, yeah. absolutely. Jeff, are there other supports that um, we didn't mention yet that people should know about? Well, the one thing, and we talked about this actually at the meeting we did in Fredonia last night, is that, as Connie said, because you have to travel distances even to get groceries, and here where I grew up, it's called going to town. So <laughs> it's a strange term that people that don't live in rural America don't understand, but if you need to go and get groceries, you go to town. Um, so <laughs> people really hate to go to town. And in our case, it's going to Jamestown or Dunkirk, they're the nearest towns where I am. Um, but people run in, they do their things, and then they can't wait to get out of there. So we have found that a lot of people are somewhat hesitant to go to some support groups that might be in more urban areas. And again, people, you know, from New York City would probably laugh if they heard me call Dunkirk, you know, an urban area. But compared to where I live right now, it is urban. Um, so what we've been focused on is obviously we promote the groups that exist and we do have them in, in Jamestown and Dunkirk and some other areas. But we also are trying to take our message to where we know people are already congregating. And that's churches. That's the Grange, as I mentioned before. That's the Farm Bureau. That's the Holstein Association. So we've spent the last two years really trying to identify in any given area, where are people already going? Where do they trust the information? And that's where we're going, as opposed to trying to get them to go someplace else that might be foreign. Because one of the, one of the biggest challenges you have is that, to your point, Matt, people in rural America feel they're misunderstood and they feel that they're going to be judged if they show up with a bunch of city slickers, right? And so they're not necessarily going to be comfortable going to a meeting where they know it's primarily going to be city dwellers that are there. So we do some work with um, DBSA, which is the Depression and Bipolar Group, and we've now started putting in place some uh, group support groups that are online that are geared towards people in rural areas. So in parts of the country, the first one was in rural Kentucky, where people, even if they wanted to go to a group, they'd have to drive quite a distance. So, and again, it's open to people from rural America. So they know that these are gonna be kindred spirits of theirs that will perhaps understand better the journey they're on than somebody who hasn't lived that experience. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, the, the farm net, even though it's not a support group per se, it's a certainly service here in New York state where they will come to you like the other service that Connie mentioned, um, you know, and unmarked cars. So you don't have to worry about the neighbors wondering why somebody from a mental health organization is sitting in your driveway. Right. Well, Man, very I important. Just comment on Jeff's comment. I was just like, we went to town. We went to town on Saturday, and and we had to do some errands, of course. And we're like, why is Top so busy? Oh, because all of us, people, all of us farmers are in town these days. So, like you said, two hours, and we're out. <laughs> um, but one more, uh, it, building on what Jeff was just saying too. So Niagara County has done in the past several years some partnerships. With, with, like you said, Jeff, places where we know people are going to be anyway. So, for instance, mm -hmm. we have reached out to some pharmacies to put special um, labels on their pill bottles or in their bags as they, they check out what their prescriptions. We also did a really... We lost neat... Connie for a lengthy period there, unfortunately. Sorry. 
That's all right. We were talking about vehicles, I think, ways to get messages out. Kind yeah. of launch you again for the internet. Uh, go ahead. We did um, some messages on pill bottles from local pharmacies. Oh. We also did a pretty successful campaign through the Opioid Awareness Task Force of flyers on pizza boxes because mm, most yeah. of our rural communities yeah. have some sort of yeah. restaurant they go to or diner they pick something up on. So some sort of a flyer on that box has been pretty successful with our crisis hotline number. And by the way, we also have a Well Niagara app, which I can share a little bit about more later. But um, again, trying to reach our people as much as we can. I tell you, there's no more moment of greater focus than when you're trying to get that pizza box open. I tell you, you're, <laughs> looking, you're wired in. You know, it's a great strategy. That's that's great. <laughs> It's the new question, right? <laughs> uh, someone just asked on the, on the chat box, how does the role of family either help or hurt the situation with seeking help? And I, it's obviously a hugely important thing, I would think. So I don't know, Jeff, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I can speak from my own family's experience that, you um, before my nephew died, we had another family member who had attempted suicide a number of times, unsuccessfully, thankfully. And when my nephew died, it was a wake-up call for her to seek help mm -hmm. finally. And it was when my family finally started talking about it. So one thing I didn't say when I was telling my family story is that when my nephew died here in this small farming town, we had people that suggested we not talk about it. We had people that were uncomfortable, that even went as far as saying, maybe you should say he died from a farming accident. Maybe you should say he had a heart attack. And my mother, who helped raise him at the time because of his father's issues, with tears running down her face, sitting in that small town pastor study, said, Pastor, we're not only going to start talking about it because this has been happening in this town too long. We're going to start talking about it in detail. And that's what really planted the seed for Rural Minds. And after my nephew died and the funeral was over and I had given the eulogy and we did talk in detail about what we knew, we had families lined up, I kid you not, for hours telling us their story. It was so emotional. And it was the first time that some of these families had ever talked about this, even with their own family. So, you know, it's so important, as I said before, to get families talking about this, not only because of the genetic predisposition, but, but families play such a critical role in rural America because sometimes if you live on a farm, that's all you see. You're surrounded by your family. You're not seeing anyone else, especially during busy times of the year. So the family plays a critical role. And Connie, I, I would hope you agree with that. 100%. I think that, and again, as, as, as we can give family members some, some techniques or tips about how to do that, one of the other things we recently trained on were, was um, suicide prevention and firearm safety. So how do you, and we do that with a suicide prevention expert as well as a firearms expert. So especially if you know, let's say that there's firearms in the house, how do you even begin that talk? How do you begin the talk anyway about if you're concerned about, about suicide potentially with your family member? What is some language you can use? Um, what to really just bring out in the open and maybe what, how not to phrase it? But how can you, how do we even handle the firearm? And, and say, you know, yeah. storing it safely and appropriately. So I think, again, I think family can be a huge help, but also hopefully if they feel they can't, you know, that there's some other trusted member of yeah. their family or their community or a coworker on the farm that they can, that they can be, you know, more, more connected to and be able to reach out just to somebody. Right. Yeah. I think one thing that we can't underline too much is when it comes to suicide, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that asking someone if they're considering hurting themselves causes people to actually complete suicide. And in fact, it saves many, many lives when people actually ask that question and get there. We just got to get more people very, very comfortable. And uh, we can't underline that enough for the general uh, population to hear and know and understand that message. Again, we're talking about talking all the time, right? Finding ways to make the talking normal, 
normalize the discussion. So we talk about this, like we talk about any other health issues. Um, we've only got about six minutes to go. I, I would like to just, I, would, I guess one question I'd like to ask would be if, for people who don't live in rural areas, what is something that each of you would really like to make sure they walk away from today's discussion knowing? Well, Connie, I you got think, one? Yeah, Connie, please. Okay, you got one? I think that that you're that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. That there is there's help, there's hope that you can reach out to a variety of sources, whether they be more of a confidential line, you know. I'm glad that we're popping up the helpline and crisis lines on there. I mean, it's literally as easy as dialing 988 for somebody mm -hmm. if you want more of a confidential aspect. I really would like to, again, help, help encourage people to download the Well Niagara app. Uh, it's not just for individual people, but it's got a bunch of information and tabs about self-care and resources, but also it's also for professionals. And family members that, again, want some language or some more information about what to look for. What are the signs? How can I approach a conversation? Um, to really just know that somebody is out there and is caring and that we will listen as much as we can. All right. Well, thanks, Connie. Jeff, uh, any messages, again, for non-rural Americans that maybe? Yeah, I, I think we've touched on quite a few of those, but just understanding the mindset of people in rural America, that they are hardworking, that they are proud, that they're not working nine to five jobs by and large, that they have additional challenges. The one thing that's been very interesting since COVID hit is there's been a flight out of urban and suburban areas. And a lot of people that used to live in urban areas are moving to rural areas. The farm next to my farm here in Chautauqua County was bought last summer by a family from Brooklyn that know nothing about rural life or farm life, but they're getting a good inside glimpse now that they own this farm next to us. So I think that, you know, COVID brought a lot of people into rural America because now in a lot of jobs, you can work from anywhere that wouldn't have necessarily considered moving to a rural area before, which the flip side of that, it's putting additional pressure on the healthcare system and some of the already limited services that we have. The thing I would like to leave with people that come from a rural background is that there is help. And that's what we've attempted to do on our website, which is ruralminds.org. We've aggregated a lot of the wonderful resources. And Connie, I wanna put some of yours from Niagara County on there as well. Um, that there is a lot of help out there, but A, you need to admit you need it, and B, you need to know where to go. The other thing I would say after having worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a good part of my career is that even if you are uninsured or underinsured, if your healthcare provider prescribes a medication for you that you can't afford because you don't have insurance or the copay is too high or whatever, if you meet certain criteria, the companies that make those drugs will make that medication available to you free of charge. And so it's important that people, when they're having honest conversations with their healthcare provider, if the doctor prescribes something to them that they don't always have time anymore to tell people about these programs that are called patient assistance programs, but they exist. And there's hundreds of millions of dollars put aside each and every year by the manufacturers of medicine if a person needs some type of a medicine. Not everyone will need some kind of medication. Maybe therapy is what they need. But if they need a medication, no one should feel that they need to go without it because they can't afford it. The help is there. Again, you just need to make sure you know where to go and the healthcare provider should be very aware of these programs. All very important information. Thank you both for the tremendous work you've been doing and for sharing a lot of this. I've really enjoyed speaking to both of you. But as a reminder to our audience, we need you to take the pledge to end stigma by going to our website, letstalkstigma.org. If your organization would like to join us in our cause, there's information on the website as well. Just click on the members tab to find out how. Together, we can reduce stigma and create an environment of support where help seeking and help giving are the norm. Once again, please thank 
thank you to our panelists, Connie Damaris and Jeff Winton. And I'd also like to thank everyone behind the scenes, Mike Telesco from Telesco Creative Group for his vision and technical support and Karen Karaszewski from KKPR Buffalo for her support as well. Uh, we hope you'll all join us for our next Facebook Live, which will be coming your way soon. If you joined us late or want to tell anyone about this episode, all of our Facebook Live programs are available at our website, Let's Talk Stigma. Dot org. So on behalf of the Erie County Anti-Stigma Coalition, until next time, I'm Matt Smith, Stand for Stigma, and good luck on your wellness journey. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.